Welcome. I'm talking about what we know about reducing our risk of dementia. But I first of all want to start off by reviewing the size of the problem of dementia and cognitive impairment. So if we look at the prevalence statistics here, you can see that the incidence of dementia and the prevalence, they increase with age, and this is a global phenomenon. It's not just restricted to Australia, it's, it occurs in every continent, and it's particularly high in the 80s and 90s. Globally, about 5 to 7% of adults aged 65 and older live with dementia, and we expect that to uh, increase to 65.7 million people by 2030. The burden of dementia falls disproportionately on low and middle income countries and that's also where the increase in dementia is going to occur uh, more so. And the increase in dementia is due to population ageing. It's not because it's easier to catch dementia or develop dementia now than in the past. It's, it's simply a, a, a result of us having more people in that age group. So at the moment there's no treatment or cure for dementia and so risk reduction is seen as a primary a way by which we may prevent incident cases. So if we look at dementia at the sort of population level, it also occurs more commonly in women than men and this has been pointed out by various governments um, and particularly in the UK they developed this infographic, Public Health England, um, saying that in the UK, 62% of people with dementia are female, 38% are male. Um, women are much more likely to take on a caring role for someone with dementia. They're more likely to give up work to care for, for someone with dementia. And they're more likely to reduce from full-time to part-time work to care for somebody with dementia. So this is an issue that hits women particularly hard. So what are the risk factors for dementia? You may hear in the media um, coffee, you may hear diet, you may hear tea, you may hear physical activity. Um, all sorts of things have been described in the literature or in the, in the popular media as risk factors for dementia. So this is a vast area. So we've developed a model that we use to think about the areas of risk. So we have risk domains and we have five domains. Um, so first of all, we have biomarkers, and I'm not going to talk about them today, but there are some genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease in particular. We then have de demographic factors, um, lifestyle, which is probably of most interest because that's where we can do a lot of modification. Uh, we have medical factors, that's also very important. And then we have environmental risk factors. So there's five areas that we address when we're looking at risk factors for dementia, and those factors moderate some common brain pathology and mechanisms and they operate over the life course, so you have, you're exposed to risk and protective factors for many years, and then ultimately you end up uh, with the cognitive function that you have in later life, um, and you could end up very uh, high functioning, so you could be have optimal cognitive ageing, which is what we'd all love to have. It's more typical to have some cognitive decline um, and that's normal, so that's sort of typical cognitive ageing, so you're not impaired but you have declined from, from what you were when you were younger. Or you could end up with a cognitive impairment that affects your daily life or dementia. So when we're looking about, at risk factors for dementia, we have to take a life course perspective. And even early life experience impacts on brain development and your, what we call your cognitive or brain reserve. The effects of risk factors accumulate over the life course, but so do the effects of the protective factors. So we need to look at both sides. So I'm now going to run through the risk factors um, according to those five domains. The first ones are demographic. I'm not going to talk about biomarkers. So we'll be talking about four domains. The first one are demographic risk factors. So age is the biggest risk factor for dementia. So there's nothing that we can do about that. It's not modifiable. And similarly, females are at increased risk. Low education does increase risk of dementia. And globally, um, if we were to intervene, the biggest impact we could make on the projected estimates of the dementia burden globally would be to increase education levels, particularly in low and middle income countries. There are variations uh, with geographical distribution of dementia within countries. So we've seen this in the countries that have got the data. So we've seen it in the UK. Uh, that could be for a variety of reasons. It could be socio-demographic factors and different distribution of risk factors within communities and populations. 
And there's different prevalence and incidence between countries as well. And again, we think that's probably due to different risk factor profiles. With lifestyle, I'm just going to run through these and you'll have to take these on uh, uh, faith from me, but these are all uh, risk factors for which a lot of research has been done. And all of this is based on what we call systematic reviews. So this isn't, when we say it reduces risk or increases risk, we're saying that on the basis of all of the evidence being synthesised um, across the literature. So we will only make a statement when we're very sure of the finding. Um, and we've done what we call a meta-analysis, so we've developed a pooled effect size. Um, so physical activity throughout adulthood has been shown to reduce risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Similarly, being sedentary has uh, been shown to increase the risk. Smoking in older adults has been shown to double the risk of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Um, there's no evidence on smoking in um, younger ages. It's just surely because there's a lack of data at the moment. It's mostly been looked at in studies of older people. High social engagement is quite protective. It reduces the risk of dementia. And the studies that looked at this asked people about their social activity, their social networks, and developed a composite score. And they said that if you had four or more social engagements a week, you were particularly protected. A cognitively active lifestyle has been shown to reduce risk in long-term studies, particularly in Sweden and the United States. They've found that the way they measured that was with a questionnaire. And it asked people things like, what books, how many books do you read? Do you go to the theatre? Have you been to the museum in the last year? Um, it wasn't actually a questionnaire about brain training or computers. It was about your lifestyle and how cognitively stimulating that is. Um, brain training, we're unclear at the moment um, whether that's uh, protective or not. There's not enough evidence. Diet. Now, that's something that we're all very interested in, um, and lots of people have, have uh, views about diet. It's very complicated. So I'm going to tell you about the research on diet because it's something we can all modify and that, that affects our daily lives. So the only food that has been shown to reduce the risk of dementia is fish. So eating three or more uh, servings of fish per week has been shown to be neuroprotective and it's also protective against stroke. Um, so some people thought, well, maybe it's the fish oils and we could take capsules instead of eating fish. And the studies that have looked at uh, taking fish oil supplementation over two years have not found a protective effect. We're not sure why, and it could be the duration, because when you think about these risk and protective effect effects, they're accumulating over decades. So if you've been eating fish for 50 years, it might be neuroprotective. The trials of fish oil capsules have been relatively short. They've been two years. And we just don't know the dose or the duration for some of these factors. So we don't want to say that they're not protective. It, it could be that, that we just haven't um, had time to investigate them thoroughly. People are now more interested in looking at dietary pattern than individual foods or nutrients. And the Mediterranean diet has been investigated probably the most of any dietary pattern. But so has the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, the DASH diet. So both of those diets have been shown to promote brain health um, and general cardiovascular health. And there's a very strong link between cardiovascular health and brain health. We've also found in some of our research and others that saturated fat has been uh, increased the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. I'm just going to look at the Mediterranean diet now. Um, so yeah, there's a diagram here of it, and, it, and at the base of the diagram it's got um, carbohydrates and at the top has meat. Um, a meta-analysis of the Mediterranean diet showed that it reduced risk of mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease by 33%, by, so by a third over two to eight years. Perhaps the hallmark of the diet is that it has a lot of uh, fruit and vegetables, or particularly lean, uh, green leafy vegetables, um, and olive oil. So there has been a one RCT of, Medi of the Mediterranean diet in 2013 that showed a benefit, and there have been some more recent um, RCTs as well. We've looked at this uh, dietary pattern um, in a, a, an Australian study, a cohort study called the Path Through Life Project um, in Canberra. And we looked at the, diet, the people that ate unhealthy diets, so had meat and potato and processed food, soft drinks, and compared them to people that had a healthier diet, so more fruit and vegetables. We found that the unhealthy diet was associated with having a smaller hippocampus. The hippocampus is an important part of the brain that atrophies early in Alzheimer's disease and um, damage to the hippocampus causes memory loss. So it's always looked at um, when we're trying to find risk factors for Alzheimer's or dementia because if something impacts on the hippocampus, it often ends up being a risk factor for dementia. 
What was more interesting about this study, though, was that over four years, um, the people that had the poorer diet also showed more atrophy of the hippocampus, which is this, what we're talking about, this long-term impact of these risk factors on the brain. So you may not actually have any cognitive problems or memory problems. This may just be something that we could measure with very fine analysis of brain scans. But ultimately, that risk factor may then contribute to the development of memory problems and ultimately dementia. However, there's a new diet that's even more um, it's strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease and seems to be uh, more tailored to brain health than the Medi diet. And this is the um, MIND diet. So it's actually based on the Medi diet and the DASH diet. And it was developed by a scientist from New York, um, Martha Morris. And she did a very fine grain analysis of the literature and tried to quantify what the neuroprotective amounts would be of the different um, types of food. And she, so she designed this diet and then she's analysed a lot of studies that had dietary data and found that it is neuroprotective. Um, she expects to refine it over time as more data comes in on this diet. And the interesting um, difference with this diet compared to the Mediterranean diet is that it uniquely specifies the consumption of berries and leafy green vegetables. So uh, research has shown that this dietary pattern was associated with less accumulation of the Alzheimer's neuropathology over a 10 year follow up. And we've actually looked at this in some Australian data and we found it was also protective, um, whereas the Mediterranean diet didn't um, have a protective effect in our data. I'm now going to talk about the medical risk factors for um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So diabetes is a very well established. I think we've done a systematic review and there's more evidence um, on diabetes than any of the other studies that's been examined in more studies. It's a consensus that it increases the risk. That's type 2 uh, mostly. Um, head injury may increase the risk of uh, dementia. Depression is an interesting one. Uh, we think now the consensus in the field is that depression does increase the risk of dementia. Initially we weren't sure because often as people develop cognitive decline in later life, they also start to develop depressive symptoms, both in reaction to the uh, awareness of cognitive problems and social uh, withdrawal, but it also seems to be um, uh, part of the prodrome of, of um, some types of dementia. So it was very difficult to disentangle the relationship between depression and Alzheimer's disease or depression and, and vascular dementia. But there's now long-term studies that have looked at people who've had major depression in young and middle adulthood and followed them up. And it does seem when we have that longer time between the diagnosis of depression and the diagnosis of dementia, it is showing up as a risk factor. And I think the consensus is that it is a risk factor for dementia now. With anxiety, it's far less clear. A lot of the studies haven't shown an effect. And it tends to be once you adjust for depression, the effect of anxiety is no longer significant. There's some evidence of stress um, and trauma being associated with risk of dementia in um, US uh, veterans. Um, again, not enough yet to have, um, make that a conclusive uh, result. Stroke, of course, increases the risk of vascular dementia. Uh, we know that post-stroke, one third of people will have developed dementia within 12 months from the study conducted in Sydney, the Sydney Stroke Study. Hypertension increases the risk of vascular dementia um, and vascular cognitive impairment. Um, it actually hasn't uh, consistently been linked to Alzheimer's. It's, it's vascular cognitive impairment that it's uh, causing. Now, high cholesterol is also interesting. Um, we've, we've looked at the literature very closely on high cholesterol, and it appears that if you have high cholesterol in middle age, so aged about 40 to 60, uh, you do have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, but not the other types of dementia. But when cholesterol is high in later life, so say from about 65 onwards, we just find no association. So it just seems to be a window period for high cholesterol. I'm now going to look at other medical risk factors. So low blood pressure has been shown to increase risk, atrial fibrillation. There's a couple of systematic reviews that, that show that increases the risk. Obesity is very interesting because obesity is so prevalent now in our society. Um, what we do know is that obesity in middle age increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, and that seems to be a dose-response relationship. So the effect size for obesity is higher than that for overweight. So even overweight, being overweight with a BMI of over, uh, over 
25 and under 30 um, is associated with an increased risk of late life dementia. But that's only if that occurs in your middle age, so between 40 and 60. What makes these questions so interesting is that we find if we look at people in later life who are overweight or obese, they don't have an increased risk of dementia. And we don't really understand the mechanism or why that is. So it's been looked at in multiple studies and this pattern is very consistent that being overweight in midlife or obese in midlife increases the risk, but late life doesn't. So some people thought it was due to reverse causality in older adults in our studies. What that means is that we have a risk factor um, like being overweight, uh, people who are developing the disease start to lose weight um, before they're diagnosed and this could actually be losing weight for up to six years before a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So if we just took that study at, at say at age 70 and we had some, we looked at weight and we looked at diagnosis, we might not know that some of those 70 year olds who appeared healthy were actually in that prodromal phase and it would give us the wrong um, message about the role of being overweight in later life. Um, but at the moment, people have tried to unpick this and we've found uh, now consistently that being overweight in later life is not a risk factor. Being underweight is a risk factor for late life dementia, particularly underweight in middle age. And so being underweight is having a BMI of less than 18.5. It's actually quite rare in a healthy population to have a BMI that low. And we think the mechanism for this is probably different than the mechanism for why being overweight is a risk factor. And it possibly is to do with other um, undiagnosed or diagnosed chronic diseases that people who are, who are that weight um, have. Uh, now I want to look at some of the medications. So antihypertensives, yes, uh, good to treat hypertension and yes, they are neuroprotective, so they do reduce the risk of dementia. At the moment, we, don't, we can't find where the one is more protective than another. It just seems that generally they are protective. There's no association between anti-inflammatories and risk of dementia. Originally, uh, one study you know, thought that there was, but that's now been um, changed. As more has been published, we now think that there's no association between anti-inflammatories and risk of dementia. And there's no association between horm hormone replacement therapy and risk of dementia. Another interesting medical risk factor that's often overlooked is high blood glucose in people who don't have diabetes. So there's now research showing that if you've got glucose that's still in the officially normal range, but it's up the, the top end of that range, you do have an increased risk of dementia. So our view about blood glucose is, is changing to be more nuanced. It's not just diabetes, non-diabetes. We really would, for optimal brain health, we'd probably want to reduce that um, blood glucose level. High homocysteine increases risk, as does renal dysfunction. I'm now going to talk about environmental risk factors. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been publications showing that air pollution increases the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. And that's really uh, quite a significant risk factor because it impacts on so many people. So this is the heavy air pollution in cities mainly caused uh, by um, fossil fuel, fuels. Um, passive smoking is something that's not yet at the point where we'd say it's, there's enough evidence to have to say it's proven or uh, it's not the evidence for passive smoking isn't as strong for things like say smoking but there's emerging evidence of passive smoking or secondhand smoke being associated with risk of cognitive decline um, and even dementia so we need to do more research into that um, and the issue with passive smoking is it can be affecting vulnerable people like um, children or people who can't move out of the way of somebody who's smoking uh, we don't have evidence on neighbourhood and there is also some very interesting research linking pesticide exposure to risk of dementia and that's in people who have an occupation that involves spraying crops or, or using pesticides in their occupation. We have a lot of limitations in our knowledge base. Um, as a researcher we're always, you know, always calling for more research money so people always expect this sort of slide but we actually do need to do a lot more work to understand the risk and protective factors for dementia. A lot of the research has been based on studies from a limited geographical um, range, so mostly North America and Europe. So for example, we don't know how BMI and obesity in some Asian countries or African countries are associated with risk of dementia. So all of that research on BMI and cholesterol has been from European countries. So we, we're lacking in the geographical representativeness of our data. 
We don't know about the age. Often we're having to make generalisations about middle, not midlife, late life. We need much more fine-grained analysis to understand some of these complicated age relationships with obesity and high cholesterol. Importantly for prevention, we don't know if we reverse risk factors if we actually re we, um, reverse risk. And that's what we need to uh, establish through randomised control trials. So you know, if people give up smoking, does that mean that their risk um, of dementia that was associated with them smoking is completely removed or is there some residual risk because they were a smoker? So those sorts of questions need to be asked uh, by properly designed research studies. Many of the studies that we have um, or we're basing our knowledge on at the moment are quite short. When you think about this is a disease occurring in people in their 80s and 90s and we might have only studied a few years of the life course, like three or four years of follow-up. So that's a limitation to our knowledge base. And the quality of our measures and criteria that we use to diagnose dementia or cognitive decline have changed over time. They also are different between countries. And we have different clinical um, classifications for some of these things like high blood pressure and high cholesterol. We also haven't talked today about interactions with genetic risk factors or genetic risk scores. And there's a limitation in our knowledge in that area. So a lot of people might say, well, you know, if you don't know um, this much about prevention, there's these gaps in the literature, you haven't looked at risk reversal, could, could prevention actually work? So I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about prevention research. It, you've got to remember this is a very new area. So probably when I started working in, in this field, people assumed you couldn't prevent dementia or cognitive decline. People didn't think about interventions. This is a whole new way of thinking that we can prevent dementia. And so the research is at a very early stage and we have to take that into account. In a lot of other areas, like something like falls or diabetes, there would have been hundreds of trials looking at different interventions for prevention. And we're still, you know, in the, in the very low numbers of prevention trials in dementia. And it's a very complicated disease with multifactorial occurring late in life. So it is going to take a long while to get this one sorted. There is um, some modelling of risk, which we've done just using epidemiological data in Australia, that shows that up to 50% of cases of dementia could be prevented by modifying seven risk factors. That's using our Australian data. That's if that reversibility actually works. But what's more convincing is this uh, trial that was published in The Lancet in 2015 where a multi-domain intervention was given to a sample of at-risk older adults. And they were, they were given an intervention that addressed physical activity, social engagement, cognitive activity and their vascular risk factors. They followed for two years and there was a benefit for people receiving this very intensive activity. Um, intervention. So there wasn't an improvement in memory but there was a difference in the intervention group on their executive function and their processing speed and their total um, score on a neuropsychological test battery. That trial is still ongoing so we're very much looking forward to the next sort of findings but most importantly whether incident cases of dementia, that is new cases of dementia in the study are less in the intervention group than in the control group. This is the trial design. It was very intensive and complicated, addressing multiple risk factors at once. And there's a view in the field at the moment that we do have to attack everything or as much as we can in one go. We can't just look at one risk factor, like just physical activity or just social engagement or just vascular risk factors. They're saying, you know, how about we try to do a multi-domain intervention? So to conclude, cognitive impairment and dementia affect millions worldwide, and this is increasing. And cognitive health and our risk of dementia are impacted by a wide range of factors. And some of those risk factors are common to heart disease and diabetes. So we need to have wide scale population level approaches to promote cognitive health in younger adults and in middle age and to prevent dementia in late life. We think that midlife is, is indicated for targeted interventions for high risk individuals. That's where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of intervention. But we need a range of culturally appropriate and well-targeted interventions for this group and for others. Thank you.